Good evening, good evening, good evening. My name is Chris Berry, and I am thrilled to be leading this discussion which you brought to you by the Transport Group. Tonight we'll be having a conversation on art and activism. I am thrilled to be with three distinguished panelists tonight. I just first wanna introduce myself. I currently serve as the president-elect of the Black Theater Network, which is an organization that has the pleasure of part partnering with the Transport Group. So we really want to thank you with the production of the, the most recent production online and all the donations going to Black Theater Network. I really cannot thank you enough institutionally how much that means for us. Please check out all the work that the Transport Group does. I also want to say thank you to everyone that's watching and I, I am thrilled to be leading this discussion on arts and activism and I can't wait to hear your questions about this discussion tonight. So I wanted to introduce our three panelists for this evening. First, we have Monique Martin. Monique Martin is a propagator of art, culture, and ideas. Monique Martin began her pa brings her passion and experience in community building through the arts to elevate and instigate. As an independent curator, producer, and marketing consultant, Ms. Martin has partnered with and produced for Joe's Pub, Disney, Disney Theatricals, Apollo Theater, New Victory Theater, South Bank Theater in the UK, Hip Hop Theater Festival, Harlem Stage, NJ Pack, Queens Theater in the Park, HBO, and numerous Broadway and off-Broadway productions. Monique's has served on the National and International Advisory Committee boards and panels, including the Association of Performing Arts Presenters, International Society for the Performing Arts, Ford Foundation, Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation, Performing Arts Exchange, Department of Cultural Affairs, FC Harlem Lions, and Women of Color in the Arts. Ms. Martin brought her vision and expertise to City Parks Foundation CPF from 2007 to 2017 as programming director for Summer Stage, where she presented relevant, fresh, and thoughtful programming to New York City communities annually in Central Park and 50 plus parks citywide, presenting over 1,200 multi genre performances, reaching audiences 600,000 plus. Wow, Ms. Martin expanded the program and by including contemporary circus, presenting local, national, and international artists. As an art and facilitator and collaborator across cultures, sectors, and genres that foster a cross-cultural exchange, she has partnered with cultural consulates and embassies from Sweden, France, Spain, Finland, Morocco, Quebec, in presenting dance, circus, puppetry, and music. Prior to joining CPF, she was, was the Associate Director of Programming for Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, LMCC, as a part of the River to River Festival. Ms. Martin, Ms. Martin is currently the Director of Programming for Harlem Stage, a performing arts center that commissions and nurtures artists of color while celebrating the unique and diverse artistic legacy of Harlem and the indelible impression that is made on American culture and around the world. Thank you for joining us, Monique. Next, I'd love to introduce Jonathan McCrory. Jonathan is a two-time Obie Award-winning Cranes New York Business 2020 notable LGBTQ leader. And, and as a Harlem-based multidisciplinary artist, he has served as artistic director at the National Black Theater since 2012. He's been awarding the Emerging Producer Award by the National Black Theater Festival of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and the Torchbearer Award by the theatrical legend Woody King Jr. He's a founding member of the producing organizations Harlem Nine, the Movement Theater Company, and national service organizations such as Black Theater Commons and Next Generation National Network. A Washington DC native, McCory attended Duke Ellington School of the Arts and earned his BFA from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. To learn more, please visit Jonathan's website, jonathanmccrory.com. The last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce to you Kevin Powell. Kevin is one of the leading political, cultural, literary, and hip hop voices in America. He is the author of 14 books, including his newest title, When We Free the World, about the present and future of our nations, available at both Apple, Apple Books and Amazon. He has been published widely, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, es and Esquire. Kevin was the producer of She, a choreo play, and is currently developing a play about manhood with Tony-nominated director Oliver Butler. He is the co-curator of the new exhibit at the New Historical Society called Hope Wanted, New York City Under Quarantine. i just really like to introduce Kevin Powell. It is a pleasure to be here with everyone. So, you know, we hear the term unprecedented times and we hear the term arts and activism. We hear those things as three entities. The, the first lob, and, and 
speaking point and talking point I wanted to interject is how does your art and activism intersect? How do those things intersect? Monique, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, for me, all of my work centers around transformation. I am always looking to provide a transformative experience for the audience and also for the artist. Mm. So how can the artists deepen their practice, expand their work? How can the space that I provide, um, what, whether that's an outdoor stage in Central Park or the South Bronx or at Harlem stage where I am currently, how can we be moved and stretched once we leave? Are we still thinking about it? Are we moved, are we challenged? So transformation is where art and activism intersects for me. And I would just uplift that. I don't know as black and brown bodies, there is any, is there ever a moment where the two don't intersect? Um, to put the black body in any space where it has, a, has any sense of power, any sense of control, any sense of uh, being able to wield its own identity, that's a political statement. Um, in a country where it was devised or derived to believe that the black body was an object to be bought and sold. Um, so the very nature of, of um, and us being three and uh, three and also four black bodies who work in, in cultural production, um, the very nature of us having this uh, conversation is a political act um, for us to be able to articulate ourselves. So transformation, yes. And also, I, I also just want to lean in that um, any black body that is allowing their tongue, their authenticness, their authentic nature, their truth to lead the, 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 the creative process in which they occupy. Um, knowing or unknowing, they're doing a political act and that political act is having a realm of activism. Now, there is a, then a conscious other layer to that activism um, where mm -hmm. um, we start to interrogate uh, how is it helping to move progress forward? And I think that's a different conversation um, for me. I just think that's a little bit different than when we start talking about, uh, we, get, we can get div uh, divis divisive when we start to be that granular sometimes. Absolutely, Kevin? Well, first of all, it's an honor to be here. I thank you all for the opportunity. Um, I mean, I'm thrilled to be an artist and an activist and, uh, for the last 36 years of my life since I was a teenager, uh, a youth. And for me, it's about freedom, it's about empowerment, but what has shifted for me over the years, um, I went from just talking about white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, but also understanding that, you know, the activism also has to be with them because we have a lot of brilliant artists out there, unfortunately, art curators who say wonderful things, do wonderful things, but are we also dealing with the, what these systems of oppression have done to us and how we relate to ourselves and how we relate to each other? I think that's very important. This is something that James Baldwin talked about. This is something that Langston Hughes talked about. This is something that Audre Lorde talked about when I did the last interview with her in 1993 via telephone as she was dying of cancer. And it's something that has stuck with me tremendously because for me, the struggle is always on multiple levels. It's the struggle against systems of oppression, number one, within the black community or communities of color, marginalized communities, how are we struggling with each other? Are we even willing to struggle with each other? And then the third piece will be always leave out, unfortunately, a lot of us, are we willing to do the work inside of ourselves so we can also go forward as we're doing this work that we say is transformative for the communities or against systems of oppression? Absolutely. Do, does anyone have any follow-ups or comments based on this? No, I, I mean, I think it's very, what Kevin's bringing up is very important. Um, there's a lot of stances and a lot of uh, people talking about this term called anti-Blackness. Um, yeah. And I think that uh, everyone needs to take stock of how they are in relationship to anti, doing anti-Blackness work. Um, how their actions uh, uh, help to breathe that. Um, and if we're not able to have that conversation, then we are keeping up another oppressive nature. Uh, I, I like to say, instead of calling people out, we need to call people in, we need to call ourselves in, call ourselves, <laughs> check ourselves, uh, really understand what practices we have done and how, what harms we have created. Um, and from there, build a bridge or build or build a space of understanding. So I think what Kevin's bringing up as far as taking a self-assessment and being honest about that self-assessment, that's deeply necessary and deeply important um, in order for radical transformation um, and this pro progress to be made clear and to show up. Because what ends up happening is that we react, you know, we react, we react. 
And what I'm interested in at this point is, are we willing to be proactive? You know, if I'm mm -hmm. saying anti-racism or sexism, homophobia or transphobia or any of the systems of oppression, you know, I don't want to just say what I'm against, but what else am I trying to build? As Ras Baraka said in a poem a long time ago, what are we building and creating? You know, I know Ms. Martin's worked for a long time. She's been consistently building and creating something. You know what I mean? Work that that is transformative and is healing. And that's sort of what I look for as an artist at this point. What are we building and creating? Are we just paying lip service to this stuff because it sounds good? And it takes, uh, it, it, it requires bravery and courage yeah. because when you talk about um, looking at self, it's the self and it's also the self of the community. And um, right. what I was thinking about as Kevin was speaking, after uh, George Floyd was murdered, there was mm -hmm. also a trans woman murdered. That's right. In the same community. And so how can we hold the value of That's black bodies for everyone? That's right. Wow. That's really profound. You know, when we're talking about the multi-level and the multi-layered nature of progress, I think it's, I would love to unpack these things in this conversation, right? Because go for I, it, go for it. No, no, I find that a lot of these conversations and I love that this group of people is here because the lip service is very present at this moment, right? So Jonathan, can you, um, the term anti-blackness, right? When I say that, what does that mean when that is said? only because I know a lot of people are saying it, but may not necessarily understand um, in, a, in a philosophical way, how it affects people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so, I mean, it is the erasure of an individual. Um, and I, I, from, my, from my, the way that I hold it as a definition, there might be different ways other people hold Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Maybe something considered a standard definition, but I'll just go from my vantage point and would love to hear what other people believe the definition or know the definition to mean um, so that uh, I can also be learned, I also can learn something in, the, in this moment. Um, from my understanding, um, anti-Blackness is, uh, it, it is acts, uh, policies, uh, modalities that are created um, that silence, uh, that erase, and that create harm uh, to people of African descent, um, people from the African diasporic um, descent, and the complexities of uh, of the black body. Um, so I would say those, when I think, when I, when I name that in the space, that's what I mean. Um, yeah. And I can see how, and I have been able to sit with, especially during George Floyd and, and after the murder of George Floyd and after the amount of conversation that's been going on and the amount of, as Kevin said, the lip service that has been happening, um, I took pause uh, personally as an artistic leader um, to understand where is my relationship to helping to create such a such a moment, um, and I can and and if I can be humble with myself and humble with the spaces that I might have caused harm um, through my acts, through the ways of who I uplifted, who I didn't uplift, um, then I can actually evolve in this moment versus be come out of this moment ready to repeat uh, mm. a repetitive space because I don't think that that, that I'm, I'm, a, I'm able to create that kind of atrocity on, in, our, in our society, in our communities. Monique, thoughts about anti-Blackness? Well, I actually have a question. When you say, and I'm kind of wrestling with it a bit because there's anti-Blackness of those folks that are outside of Black community, and then there's anti-Blackness within the Black community. Um, yes. yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And so let's let's go yeah. from outside first. Let's go from the outside, then we'll, then we'll look in. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. Well, you know, this country was built on that. You know, we 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 were already um, suspect and a criminal and um, in a very specific category in Africa, as we walked, you know, from the interior to the coast. Um, it started there you know, not when we arrived here. And so uh, all the layers of what is acceptable uh, behavior from a black body, what is acceptable speech, you know, we're always under a microscope and um, being brought to this country uh, forced, we 
we never have a time to kind of relax and figure out yeah. our own blackness, our own expression of blackness. And what's been extraordinary is we continue to evolve and we continue in that evolution inspire. And so you see that with our culture, our music, our fashion, our swag, uh, our language being an inspiration and um, you know a catalyst for change across the globe. But do we take time? Right, right. To acknowledge that, to own that. That's right. Um, so that's on the outside of of those, you know, then putting into question. Uh, so we're we're, we're sometimes, uh, oftentimes. Um, even struggling with ourselves of our own mm-hmm. value. And that's where that outside gaze mm-hmm. starts to trip us up if we allow it. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. I mean, it's it's anti-blackness. I mean, where do you where do you start? I'm glad that Jonathan, I believe Jonathan brought the term up first. It, it's it's important to yeah. put it out there. Um Anti-blackness for me means um, I'm the son of a, a single black mother who was a Geechee from the low country of South Carolina who had to flee the South with her two sisters to get a better life in the North. And mm-hmm. it was a better life. It was going from Southern poverty to Northern poverty. Uh, anti-blackness means that these three black women had to do whatever they could to survive, even as mm-hmm. they young single mothers. Anti-blackness means that I'm the first generation coming after the civil rights movement, which meant I was the first generation to go to integrated schools. Anti-blackness is going to school and being an A student as I was K through 12 and not seeing anything about black art, black culture, not Alvin Ailey on the wall behind Miss Martin, nothing about the National Black Theater, Barbara and Teal, nothing about black history whatsoever. We were slaves. That's about a paragraph that I got. Uh, Rosa Parks refused to give her seat. Dr. King had a <laughs> <laughs> Watson Carver messed around with some peanuts, and that was the totality. Yeah, of my education on blackness. So it was anti-blackness. The education I got was white supremacist education. We understand that. I knew I wanted to be a writer since I was eight or nine years old. I've been writing since I was a child. I did not know that Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Amir Baraka, Sonia, we can go through a list of folks. I didn't know any of them existed. That's called anti-blackness. I had to go to college and happened to have a professor named Dr. Cheryl Wall for a class called Harlem Renaissance, something I had never even heard of, or Harlem Renaissance, to realize that I too could be a black writer. So anti-blackness is an abusive relationship that we've had with this country. Mm. When Ms. Martin was talking about you know, when we were brought over here. I mean, that's, it's abuse. This is a traumatized country. One of my sister friends, a uh, white sister named Eve Enzo, who now goes by V, just V, you know, has said that the whole country is traumatized. You see it when you see white folks now revolting against all of this stuff, realizing, wait a minute, we are vulnerable here too, but we've been dealing with this for at least 401 years. If you use 1619 as the marker, even though we know that black folks were here before 1619, but in mm-hmm. terms of this white supremacist patriarchal capitalistic society that has abused us, you know, historically where we've had to create black art, theater, dance, the visual arts, writing, whatever it is, as a way of resisting it, you know, resist, 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 as Sonia Sanchez has said many times in her poems, that's all, you know, uh, responding to anti-blackness, but I also want to bring it to Toni Morrison, which I think is important if people have not seen the documentary on her life, is important where she keeps challenging us not to center whiteness any longer. I agree with that. Absolutely. I love all people. Let me make that clear. I love all people, all people, all people, but I also love my African self because I understand that the response to anti-blackness is to say that I'm an African. I'm very clear about that and that I come from this land base called Africa and my history did not start with slavery. It started long before slavery. You feel what I'm saying? And so I think that's part of it. And then the last piece for me around anti-blackness that's the struggle that we deal with and the struggle we deal with each other when people say to me things like in 2020, you know, don't call me brother, don't call me sister, you got good here, you got bad here. Mm-hmm. You know, we know that that's part of anti-blackness, it creates black self-hatred. And, you know, um, the word that, that Jonathan used, humility is important because if a sister or brother, a person, if even if they're non-gender conforming who happens to be black, African comes and says, can you help me? You listen, you listen, you listen. You don't diss them. You don't practice anti-blackness by dissing them, by giving them a lecture, by acting like you're more important than them. These are the things that I've seen in the artistic world for the last 36 years. I'm talking about theater, literature, film, across the board. Even as I have loved working with my fellow black creatives, I understand that most of us have internalized white supremacy and how we treat each other. And don't even think we do. It doesn't matter if we're straight or queer. It doesn't matter if we're male, female, non-gender conforming. 
all of us have been socialized to hate ourselves and each other consciously and subconsciously, just like we talk about the conscious bias of white folks, well, we got a conscious and unconscious bias as well toward each other. So I bring it back to James Baldwin, love. If we're not practicing love, then what are we doing here? And, and that, you know, what you're talking about and bring it back to that initial comment, Jonathan, when you were talking about the mere existence of your art is activism, it's clear, right? And and the, the walk you all have been walking in your art is clear activism because you've also had to be subject matter experts in places where someone told you there wasn't or there was no mm. history or there was. So how, in regards to, did you view that as activism coming through your educational process or do you retro, like retroactively look back at it and go, holy hell, that was radical, like that was courageous to stand up for what I knew was true and to, you know, or even investigate what truth was based upon what was told to me. And how did that influence the work that you do now? That's a great question. So I, so I had the blessing of going, coming from uh, DC when I was black um, and, <laughs> um, and uh, going to Duke Ellington the School of the Arts um, under the beautiful guidance of Mike Malone and um, with a lot of great uh, Charles Augens, Kathy, I mean, like I, I had, I was, I, my skin was codified in understanding of who I needed to know and who yeah. and how I need to know my reflection is full of regal brilliance. Um, and so, and so I, 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 and I, and I've begun to understand in a lot of ways that that was a gift. Um, mm. that that gift was a rare gift that many other Black creatives didn't necessarily have, um, to be in an incubator where I got to accelerate my understanding of how I sit at the apex of brilliance. And that apex of brilliance is, has so much opportunity and that my tongue is connected to that and that my actions speak that and that I'm part of grace inside of that, all of that. So like all of that lofty, beautiful language, I got to really sit with that for four years. And that yeah. was and and, and and at Duke, it was a uh, it was an abnormal high school experience. You were at school at eight o'clock in the morning. You didn't leave until ten o'clock at night because I was in rehearsal. I was in X, Y, and Z. So, so like, so like, what I want to say is that I was in an incubator to really, really wrestle with this term of this term of really understanding that as a black artist. Um, it is my obligation, um, it is my privilege, and it is my duty to not only carry, carry the torch to make sure doors open for others, but make sure that I also, that I also like make sure that the, it goes this way, that I don't think of a hierarchical way of just like uh, excelling, but I think of also a unilateral way, right? I dismantle the, uh, the notion of um, capitalism inside of my very nature and that, act, and that I have to be active in my activism, I have to be activated inside of it. I have to be active in my community. I have to be present in my community. Um, so, so I, it, it's very interesting when you ask me that question. When did I? When did the realization happen? The realization uh, was actually drilled inside of me yeah. in high school, and then I realized the fortune I had when I went to NYU. Totally different mm. environment, where 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 that kind of where that kind of codified skin was actually. Um, tried to be dismantled by the system of NYU, which was white supremacy at its very much at its core. So, so it's like it's a, I had an adverse kind of experience, and I would say, the, the brother Powell, like 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 mine wasn't necessarily like I. It wasn't until a la it was it, it was like I I came through really understanding when I was getting groomed as a high school like freshman to senior in high school like groomed to really love this skin, love this space, and also I was in D.C. when it was black and that. We all know what that means. That's why we all laugh because we know what that <laughs> Chocolate City was when Chocolate City was Chocolate City. Um, that for that to be my foundation is a quantum leap experience. Then, 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 then I think most people might have had. So I just wanted to uplift that. Yeah. Well, I grew up in um, the Bay Area when it was black. And, um, you know, born in Berkeley and very multicultural. I mean, we had, you know, Japanese gardener on one side, mm. a black family, classic black family, uh, working class on the other side. 
um, hippies growing marijuana, which we didn't even know, but my dad knew. Um, and on the other side, and then we moved to Oakland and we moved to deep East Oakland. Mm. So we had, um, you know, it was black, 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 blickety black, black. Um, <laughs> and that was kind of a culture shock. So I can understand how we have internal mm. biases mm -hmm. based on those two uh, very stark differences. And one of the many values of going to high school in Oakland, I had black teachers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Love me and encouraged me to write, encouraged me to, we had a, you know, radio station, a television station at the school. This is a public school in Oakland, Castleman High School. Um, so I had a foundation and then moving to, um, New York and working in white spaces, my family, especially my dad, you know, my mother, entrepreneur, mother of six. Um, so I grew up with parents who were hustlers and they never mm. complained or felt burdened by um, a white boss. I, mm. I, I just never heard that growing up. So this idea that you have some um, power over me, even if you yes. are my boss, mm. is it a part of my consciousness? Um, yeah. So that has served me well and sometimes <laughs> not so well. Um, but I know who I am. And, you know, I come from people who um, know how to make things, mm. you know, whether that's gardening, my mom, my maternal family from Texas, you know, they're farmers. So just being able to grow something from your hands um, mm. just positioned me um, with the consciousness that my identity and my value is not tied to this project or this institution. That's right. Um, so, you know, I came through uh, all so many white spaces uh, with that um, attitude and with that you know, understanding and consciousness. And now I'm in, for the first time in my career, a black space. And so it's interesting to uh, understand the stark um, lack of resources and limited resources in the two. I mean, it, it's, it's shocking um, how much, uh, how deep our work needs to be just to do the basics, to keep yeah. the lights on, to keep the doors open, to keep the staff intact. And that's not just because of COVID, that's black institutions across this country. So uh, now that activism and social justice is at the forefront, forefront of people's understanding of what we need in art and what's valuable in art, um, whether that's DJ Nice, DJ D Nice, and you know the alchemy of the of the DJ, you know what happens on the dance floor. It's not frivolous. I mean, we 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 are alive because of hush arbors and sacred spaces where we could let loose. So bringing that consciousness of a black community forward into white spaces and black spaces has um, just provided me with a level of freedom that I hope to. Um, extend to the artists that I'm blessed to support and the audiences. Absolutely. Wow. I, I, I love the Bay Area this morning. I just said that's my second home. So I, and the Bay Area loves you. <laughs> <laughs> I um, it's and first, this is just a rich conversation. I'm really enjoying just listening to Jonathan and, and Monique and just thank you all for the thoughts are just moving through my head as everyone's speaking. I mean, it's an interesting question you pose. Uh, Brother Barry, um, I could sit here, you know, well, Jonathan actually made me think about it um, because if I look at my formal education, yep, white, white supremacist. But I had to realize when I first got to, got to uh, Zorna Hurst's Their Eyes of Watching God um, in college as an 18 year old and Malcolm X's autobiography and a few other books, I realized that I had all the black history that I needed inside mm. of my mama and my aunts and my folks <laughs> down south. And every time we took that Greyhound bus, because we know how folks migrated, certain folks migrated to California, some went to the Midwest, some went up the East Coast to DC and mm. New York and New Jersey. And so I'm a proud family of Geechees. And I realize now that I realized quickly that it was beautiful poetry. It wasn't broken English. It wasn't bad English and all the hateful stuff that we say about the language that we speak. 
you know, I realized that the way my mother prepared food was beautiful and it was part of our culture, what we call soul food. I realized that um, the way she played the radio in the kitchen and we heard everything from spirituals, which is to the, why to this day, I barely listened to any spirituals made after 1970 because I'm like, I need the old stuff my mama played. <laughs> I realized that as my mother talked about Marvin Gaye and Dinah Ross and the Supremes and James Brown and the Apollo Theater, where she had gone as a young woman when she had migrated up there, how important that was. I realized how even the black church experience, how that was theater. That is theater. That is theater, yeah. you know. And unfortunately, I didn't have the skill sets when I was growing up to understand and appreciate it because there was that disconnect, you know. Absolutely. Uh, what Jonathan described is what I would say, like, if you have a parent or parents who are woke versus parents who are just, they're, they're black, but they're not woke. They're not like woke, you know what I'm saying? And so I knew I was black, but there was also like, you know, whiteness was superior, basically. You know what I mean? And it does a disservice to us and it does a disservice to white folks. I mean, yeah, I can quote Shakespeare to this day because I worship Shakespeare. I, I worship Edgar Allan Poe, I uh, worship Charles Dickens. But I, you know, it wasn't until I was in the 12th grade, I had a black teacher named Mrs. Lillian Williams, God bless her soul. She died a few years back and four generations of students showed up for her. That's how powerful this black woman was. And her husband happened to end up being the first uh, black school superintendent in Jersey City. She was the first teacher I had in those 13 years of school who said that I could write. She was the first one who acknowledged it. Maybe entered an essay contest. I won a citywide essay contest as a black boy, which was unheard of. You know what I'm saying? And she gave me something that I needed, and it's something that that the word that Jonathan used about incubating. You know, there wasn't that incubation there. You know, mm -hmm. I actually drew as a child before I even wrote as a child. But my mother didn't know that. You know, what he might need to have art classes because it wasn't that kind. Yeah. I think I also think it's important to make a distinction. Um, I grew up in a place called Jersey City. I don't diss Jersey City. It made me who I am. But I noticed that when you got black folks who come from places like DC, the Bay Area, Detroit, Atlanta, it's like the same kind of attitude that you see in the energy and the spirit and the swag that you see from black folks coming from Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, Tobago. You feel what I'm saying? Because you see black possibilities all over the place. And so if you don't see black poss possibilities in front of you, this is where art comes in. We at least need to see theater. We need to see dance. You know, we need to see these possibilities. Otherwise, you'll grow up like me, not thinking that black folks create art at all. But once I realize as an adult, Kev, you've been around adult art your whole life. We just didn't call it art. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, it yeah. yeah. That's what black folks did. You know, the way we, I mean, my mother showed me how to do the jerk, the funky chicken, you know what I'm saying? The twist, the mashed potato. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? It was all teaching me art. Yeah, I realize now. And so I think that um, when I, think about it, you know, uh, as we go through this period of, of Black Lives Matter, you know, I, I say to folks who identify as white out there, you've been badly deprived if you know nothing about Black people, Latinx people, Native American people, Asian people, if you don't know anything about the LGBTQ plus community, if you don't know anything about disabled people, you know, because what kind of education is it, including an art education, if it's not inclusive of all the people that Monique Ms. Martin was talking about that she grew up with around in Berkeley in, in the Bay Area? You know, it does a disservice to you. For me, once I got to college, I spent my four years in the E-185 section of the library, which is where all the black books are, y'all, for those who remember that, the E-185 section. And I absorbed myself in the Harlem Renaissance, the Negritude writers, the Black Art Salute, and everything that I could, discovering the last poets, discovering the Watts prophets, you know, uh, studying theater, John. I studied every playwright I could. I mean, you know, I just went deep. And then I realized after college, wait a minute, Kevin Powell, you learned a lot about a lot of black male people black male artists, but you barely learn anything about black women art. So now you got a whole nother level of work to do. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's a nonstop education. Yeah. So, so this process, you know, what I find to be a part of this activism discussion is decentering the white gaze in the work that we do so that it's not necessarily, it's not the assumed neutral um, or the assumed, like when we don't put a hyphen behind something that it means white. How how do you decenter? How are you actively decentering white gaze in your work? And how can you recommend, especially to artists that are looking to like infuse activism into their work, tools and ways that you decenter whiteness in the work that you do? I just want to add that um, you also have to decenter patriarchy as long there as you go. whiteness. Um, yes, our disease that sit at the center of our being. Exactly. Um, and I didn't mean to speak first, but I just wanted, I, as we answer this. No, question, that's perfect. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Add that element of coding to it because that patriarchy is, can be, is something that has destroyed our movements, actually. Um, mm. Actually being able to be sustainable and thrivable. Um, when I think about someone like Dr. Barbara Antier, who, um, as a woman, a black woman, um, who founded a theater company, who bought a city block, patriarchy 
limited her visibility, her her, notor her notoriety, and yeah. actually made her a threat um, to her counterparts to some degree because she couldn't be controlled um, by this notion of that 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 hierarchy was built on. So so I, for me, how do I how do I do it? I, again, it goes from I for me, my leadership goes from my individual practice to then how does it ripple out? Um, I honor my she energy. I think that I think that my spirit is guided by a she. I my pronouns are he him. My spirit is a she. I say that every single time. That allows for me to understand the sensitive vibration that you actually are responding to. The thing that actually is saying that's making uh, having you have some type of reflection is that space. Is that is that she energy that's a part of me? And then therefore, I have to honor the women that are in my space. Like. I first person I said I wasn't doing that as a disrespect, Monique. But I was just like, Monique, do you want to go first? Because yeah, because because like because it's very easy for when I understood when I when I didn't when I centered myself in my masculine self, it was very easy for me to overshadow, overpower. But I wasn't honoring the gift that a woman's energy provides me to be able to be present in this world. And that is what people are responding to. So I think that's a person, I think that it, it, it is a personal state statement that then can trickle out through action. Um, Absolutely. Uh, and I think that it's a centralization that we have to really look at because it has silenced great giants from being able to do their sustainable work that could have healed our planet. Mm. You're so fierce. <laughs> You're a synthesizer. I call him Rev. He knows that. Uh, Reverend. Um, you know what I think about is how we are unlearning mm. during okay. this time. Um, because we are, you know, our work is in the framework of this country. Right. And what it values and what it has said is high art. That term is still being used, um, whether that's to uh, articulate opera or classical music, you know, these European art forms. And so we either try to retrofit our voices into that right. or we create, you know, a new piece like Wole uh, Shiinka you know, mm -hmm. brought over some wonderful ways of, you know, ritual, thinking about theater as ritual, performance as ritual. Um, and as Kevin said, the black church is, if I mean, if the black church, if Pentecostal and any black church, if that's not ritual, exactly. come on, you yeah. know, all of it, the, 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 the movement, yes. the song, the word, yes. um, but we haven't, either um, one, given it its value outside of the church, A. and two, put that up with any opera that's at the Met or any of the other um, exactly. esteemed venues. Um, and do we have the power to do that? Is this a time where we can um, amplify that mm. more? You know, or are we waiting for the New York Times to give us a review that says, okay, mm. well, that's that new thing. That's that transformative thing. You know, or are we naming it that? And I feel that's what's happening now. There's a, there's a level of um, boldness that mm. I'm feeling bubbling up, you yeah. know. Absolutely. Chris, I think Hannah's trying to get your attention. Oh, no, I got her. I got her. Uh -oh. So the la so before you jump in, Kevin, I want to jump into the YouTube audience and let you know, please ask questions for our panelists. We'll begin to answer some questions from all of you once we get them our way. I mean, I, I don't need to say anything else. I think they covered everything. <laughs> I'd love to hear the questions. Um, you know, then it's, what they said was very powerful. Um, are, are there questions agree. already or are we waiting for questions? Or We're waiting for questions, but I have one more thing because the production Broadband Arkansas one of the, the, the key features that was said that they wanted to focus on, and I just want to thank the transport group for producing this work as well, mm -hmm. that we don't necessarily always center the Black experience through trauma for audience. 
<laughs> and that it's not and it's not always trauma presented, but that at the center of it, it's a family responding to something. So how so Jonathan, you're laughing. Um, I think we've had a conversation about this before, but in regards to that, in regards to the production of work, how important do you think it is to show the the multiplicity of, of the, like not being monolithic in regards to just putting trauma on display for audiences? <laughs> I mean. Something that Monique said um, resonated with me, you know, um, about not feeling like you have to answer to people that you work for people. One of the things I pride myself on with these 14 books, and I, I'm proud to say that I've written 14 books. I started really young in my 20s. I'm like, I'm going to write the books that I want to write, not what someone thinks I should write, not what mm -hmm. folks think I should be talking about, because I'm a black boy. I'm a black boy who grew up with a black mama. But I'm also a black boy who grew up with friends of all different backgrounds. I'm a black boy who comes from the ghetto, but also lived in a white neighborhood from age 13 to 18. I'm a black boy who grew up on welfare, but also went to college. I'm a black boy who loves Shakespeare and I love hip hop. I'm a black boy, you know, who who uh, is a huge sports fan. But as Jonathan said, I also understand my my feminine energy. I understand uh, that I cannot support patriarchy, homophobia, transphobia in any form. Why should I deny every aspect of who I am just to fit into someone else's box? I'm not with that. Mm -hmm. As an artist, yeah. as a creative person, and so you know, in my experiences, be it you know, film, theater, TV, books, magazine articles. I've had to fight nonstop to say, why do you keep thinking that black people or people of color are simply one dimensional? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Why don't, you know, uh, and, and so I, you know, I've walked away from, I've walked away from tons of money. I've turned down tons of money because I'm not interested in selling my soul nor selling my art just to, to make someone else feel good. And, you know, do I do, do I believe that art should be a space, you know, uh, to, to, to help people heal? Absolutely. To work through things. Have I done it with my own work? Absolutely. But I also think that it should be a space where if I want to laugh, I can laugh. If I want to dance, I can dance. Okay. There's all those different things. And I feel that um, the real issue to me is not that Black folks are creating art that's trauma-filled. The, the problem is, as V has said, a.k.a. Vincent, the whole country has been trauma-filled from the very beginning when Native mm -hmm. Americans were victims of genocide and African people were kidnapped from Africa. And so if you're rooted in bloodshed and trauma, then you're going to have nothing but trauma and you're going to expect nothing but trauma as if we can't have any other kind of conversations because it begs the question, when are we going to heal here? When does this ever end? You know what I mean? Or are we just going to be on the yeah. show just saying the same stuff over and over again? And that's what I think about. You know, if people go back um, one of the things I talk about in my new, my new book is intentionally called When We Free the World. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm like, okay, we keep talking about what's wrong, but when are we going, what, what, what does freedom look like? You know, we know yeah. what oppression looks like, but what does freedom actually look like? Has anyone even thought about that? You know what I'm saying? In theater, in dance. And no, we have, of course we have, because we have genius in this panel with Ramonique and Jonathan. But I think for everyone out there, you know, what informs my art, I'm not sitting there saying, okay, I'm going to write a piece about freedom right now. I follow the spirit, the universal spirit. Some say he, some say she, some they, some say they. That leads me. Whatever I write, it comes from my ancestors. It comes from that spiritual energy. I'm like, this is what I got to get out of me right now. You know what I mean? And if it happens to be something that deals with mental health, you know, or, or physical violence or, or something that has happened to me or my family or my people or people in general, then so be it. But at the end of the day, you know, I want to continue to create art that, that's about healing and, and, and trying to figure out some solutions here because I don't want the black boy who is sitting there and reading the education of Kevin Powell, my memoir to walk away any way other than how I felt when I read the autobiography from Malcolm X. When I finished that book, I cried because it was a great work of art. And then I said, okay, this is what I got to do with my life now because now I have an example of what is possible. That's what art should Absolutely. be. And we've also learned from those that were in had in charge of the, the purse strings, in charge, you know, who, who had the funding. And uh, what we're seeing in terms of the foundation of Black theater, um, a lot of it comes out of protest theater. Right. Yeah. And the civil Absolutely. rights. So prior to that, the theater that was happening um, was in, it was, it was uh, you know, pre-segregation. Um, you know, I mean, so it, it happened when communities were separated. That's right. So now mm -hmm. we have funding that comes. And what do the funders want to see? 
Yeah. The funders are funding work that speaks about the injustices and that, that was relevant work. I mean, there's some incredible work from Amir, Amiri Baraka, um, mm -hmm. you know, many of our incredible playwrights from that time. And so then that continues to get funded, that continues to get reviewed. And how do you bring in, you know, some joy, some, right. Right. Um, you know, even thinking about August Wilson's work with the magic and the mysticism that he had in his work. Um, I know when I came, my mom and I took a trip to um, New York before I moved here and we saw um, the play, August Wilson's play where um, he curses God. Oh my God. Um, Joe Turner come and gone. Joe Turner, No, yeah. before that, before that. He, I think he curses him in almost every. <laughs> Are you talking about with Charles? Was it Ma Rainey? Charles Ma Rainey. Ma Rainey. Ma Rainey. Ma Rainey. Ma Rainey. It, shocked, it shocked me when he did that, but I was like, "Wow." My mother was like, "Let's go." <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We almost. I mean, I had to beg her wow. to stay. Wow. She was ready to go. So yeah. you know. You know, the, there are those challenges as well in, in terms of what is Christianity? What do you believe in? You know, do we have space for mysticism? Um, yeah. And so mm -hmm. what gets funded? And I'm, I'm also thinking about, I mean, I'm just proposing these and I, I, no solutions other than, you know, create what makes your heart sing and what's going what's gonna to move the narrative, what's going to move the needle. But I also think about um, South African theater right. and where they are now, most of their theater, a lot of their theater, or at least the theater that we were able to um, experience was anti-apartheid, was protest theater. And so now they're wrestling with what is their post-apartheid voice? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I feel that's a place where we're in now that social justice is trending, funders are now, um, um, addressing the inequities in funding. And so we have an opportunity to put some other voices and other work out here. So I'm excited. And I also, and I also just real quickly, I also just wonder um, uh, really around what does it mean to uh, build work in a system that is baked off of excess wealth from slavery? Like, Ooh, yes, is built off of excess wealth from slavery. Foundation culture is built off excess wealth from slavery. And so when we start to talk about actually creating works that are the antithesis of activism is against kind of it's like it's it's like a little bit of a of, of, of a of a mind of I don't mean to curse, but a full I, I know I'm gonna say it, but a mind, you know what I mean. Because, <laughs> because, the very, because, because the very notion of the works that we're talking about, Mary Baraka, Mary uh, the works of 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 the Heaven and Soweto, Soweto, they weren't funded per se by the system. They were working, yeah. they were on the streets working against the system and they were figuring out how to make their voice be heard whichever way it could be heard. And so what does it mean now that this the the thing of activism is is wants to be in a fundable space. How actual? How radical? How free? How how um how liberatory can it actually be? How can it speak from a place of its own liberation? Um, when it's being funded by a system that has memory, echo, and blood of slavery, memory, echo, and blood of actually oppression. Where how 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 free can it be? So that's what I wonder. Absolutely. So we have a couple questions from the, the YouTube audience. So the first question is, are you encouraged by this moment in history? And how are you encouraged? I'm, I'm Mark, Ms. Martin, you wanted to say, I saw you about the. I, you know, I'm inspired. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. I'm inspired. I am inspired by um, my white colleagues my mm. Italian and Irish, because I think we should abolish the word white, white? and black yes. forever. Okay. Can we can we I do agree. that? Think about that. Um, you know, we're the only country that uses that to identify people. Other cultures and countries, you know, use the, the, the culture they're from. So anyway, I'm inspired and encouraged by um, my colleagues in the field who um, you all probably experienced this as well, that were sliding into my DMs right after, um, you know, the protests really uh, began to kick up. 
you know, Monique, what should we be doing? What should we be reading? Yeah. You know, where, where should we go? And um, as frustrating as that can be or, or was at that time, you know, these are people who I work with. These are people who I know is coming from their heart. Um, and it demonstrates the lack of education in this country. Exactly. I mean, exactly. White folks don't even know about their own history. And yeah. so mm -hmm. as an example, one of my colleagues says, you know, I saw on somebody's page, you wrote white is a construct to mm. oppress black. I've never heard that term before. What do you mean white <laughs> is a construct? Yeah, yeah. This is a highly educated yeah. leader yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. of an institution yeah. in this city. Yeah. So at least she was willing and felt safe enough with me to That's ask that question. Facts. And I didn't reflex. Like, you've never heard that before. I had to really take that in and have some compassion. Right. Right. Um, right. And, and take it as an opportunity to break it down. So, um, so I'm inspired by that. And I also wanted to say, in terms of artists that are looking for places to um, advance their work, Harlem Stage, National Black Theater, the Apollo also has residency programs and we are looking for bright voices, bold voices. And a lot of artists of color don't have, um, you know, a deep understanding on what it takes from ideation to premiere and yeah. what all is involved in that. And this is also an opportunity to kind of break that down. And, and there, there, there is a pathway to um, getting your work um, created, done and ready to tour. And that's what I'm up for and hopeful for. Awesome. I mean, to uplift what Monique was talking about, the, the, really the real encouraging part, um, part about this moment is that it's allowing for true ideation uh, to happen, development to happen. Um, there's a kind of uh, intentional pause that mm. um, culture's having to have from potentially a forward facing, like we're creating productions like we used to. We get to think from, we get to think from a different space and a little more nuanced space. Um, and then we also get to really incubate um, and think about intentional incubation. I mean, like for MBT, to what Monique was talking about, our residency programs we're still investing in. We're still we're still we're still breathing life into them. Um, even for MBT, we just announced our playwright residents. We went from three playwright residents to I mean two player residents to three player residents, and we increased the fee for our producer and resident. So like there's a there's a way there's a way in which that the encouragement for me is that I'm seeing my colleagues really think about how does it mean to invest truly invest in freelance artists um, and to actually create a space for them to because uh, they were the ones that were kind of uh left to find like figure it the crumbs out for themselves after the shutdown um many freelance and freelance designers in particular uh were who had set up jobs uh basically were left with nothing when we all shut down when 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 we weren't allowed to gather anymore so what's exciting to me is seeing how we're innovating the way that we support freelance artists and creating spaces for them to get paid um, in order to dream again um, and having them dream from a space uh, that allows for us to imagine what could this world be, not what this world was and what this world is right now. For me, I'm, I'm very, very encouraged by it. As an activist, I mean, this is my life just as much as it is an artist. I'm out there in the streets as well, protesting and, and writing. Um, I'm very encouraged by any movement because we know movement is mass energy of people. It's, it's a wonderful thing to see. Um, but we've been here before. We need to be clear about that. We've been here many times before. And what I'm interested in now is power and power sharing. And what I mean by that is everything that, that my two colleagues have talked about. You know, whether you have a black run and owned institution like the National Black Theater, or you're working in some other space, you know, are black people, people of color, groups that have been historically marginalized at the table as equals in every way possible. That's mm -hmm. what I'm interested in. Because if we go back to the 1960s, early 1970s, we know that the civil rights, black power, black liberation movements led to a lot of people of color getting on TV, 
getting theater opportunities. You know, I had, I, I remember one of the interviews I did with Melvin Van Peebles, he talked about how he was able to get his films done, his theater productions done. He's on Broadway the whole nine yards because of the movement. But what did not happen was power sharing, which is why you find the generations that came after that, Generation X and millennials saying, okay, what do we do now? I mean, here I am a writer of 14 books. I've made zero from my first 13 books because of the, the, the power dynamic of contracts for writers in the publishing world. So at a certain point, who cares that I've been published by Random House and Simon & Schuster, et cetera, when I look at the contracts and it's so slanted power-wise yeah. towards the publishers, just like the contracts are so slanted towards music industry, uh, music record labels, as opposed to the artists. And which is why you see so many artists out here during the pandemic saying, what are we going to do? You know, which speaks to both Jonathan and, and Martin, Monique's point. It's about power and power sharing. And it means that white brothers and sisters, white people who have been in these historically, these spaces, and, and as Jonathan said, spaces that have been have benefited from white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, have to share power. How do you do it? When Jon Stewart stepped down as the host of The Daily Show, people don't think about this, but he picked a black man, Trevor Noah, to replace him because he understood, I need to use my privilege, you know, to change this. What did Serena Williams' husband do? He stepped down as CEO of Reddit. I'm not saying that everyone has to step down from these positions, but you do need to examine, you know, how have I benefited? How have I, my community benefited from this construct of whiteness, as Monique talked about, to the detriment of people of color for 400 Absolutely. years, including Absolutely. the artistic community? This is a real conversation. This is what, what August Wilson is talking about. What I suggest to people, go back and look at the conversations that August Wilson had in the 1990s about Black theater, the importance of Black theater. Go back and read at least the first chapter of Howard Zinn's book, A People's History of the United States, please, where he says, I'm going to talk about America through the lens, not of the conquerors, but of the people who have been conquered, which is a very important thing. Why did Howard Zinn do that? Because he, as a white brother, was a young activist during the civil rights movement in the 60s. He was inspired by black folks. He admitted, just like Monique Martin's colleague, I know nothing about America because I know nothing about black, brown, yellow, red people. You feel what I'm saying? So it means that there has to be a willingness to be re-educated and understanding that all of us, all of us have been grossly miseducated. Unless you had a parent or parents or an education the way Jonathan did or a situation of an environment like Monique did, most of us have not come from that. That's white folks, black folks, everybody in between. We've all been miseducated. But it also means that this power dynamic has benefited folks who have benefited from white supremacy, which is folks who are identified as white. Monique is right. What else should you do? Go back and watch Martin Scorsese's film Gangs of New York and look at the mm -hmm. tension between native whites yeah. and the foreign whites and how the native, the foreign whites eventually had to become white. They had to stop being Italian, had to stop being Irish. This is, is a construct to benefit a handful of people. And so when you say that something is high art, I mean, I love Shakespeare, but Shakespeare ain't more important than Toni Morrison or Sonia Sanchez, Nikki Giovanni. I'm sorry. They're yeah, not, Shakespeare's not more important than Mary Baraka. I'm sorry. Pablo Neruda is as important as Emily Dickinson. I'm sorry. You know, and so once we start to look at it in that way where everything truly is equal, because I don't actually want to be equal to anyone. I want my humanity respected at every level. That's what yeah, I'm yeah. talking about at this point. You know what I mean? Respect yes. as a human being. So if I happen to be a straight person who's black or a queer person or a disabled person or a poor person, do you still recognize that I contribute something equally to this world? That's what we're talking about. So it's about power and power sharing. If, it does, if that's not the conversation at this stage, then I'm not interested in having a conversation, seriously. And that's for the whole art world. So we have a little bit of time left. We, all, we also have one more question. And I think it's a nice question to end because it's coming from an idea and we touched about it a little bit. What would you all say to young artists that are entering the theater world at this time? How And how would you suggest that they hold institutions accountable? Build your own community. No one, you know, can do it on their own. And theater in its nature is collaborative. And I think a lot of our artists, um, because we have uh, limited resources for a number of reasons, um, if, you, if you're not coming as a trust fund baby, because a lot of the uh, theater companies, you know, students graduate from Yale or Juilliard or, or, or different schools and they come out with a community and with a few coins from their family. So they can put up their first production. And we often um, want to do it uh, on our own. And I'm sharing this from my three years now at uh, Harlem Stage and we have a fund for new work and it is designed for emerging artists. And there's 
so many conversations that I've had where the artist is uh, the writer, the director, the dramaturge, <laughs> and they sew in the costumes on the weekend. <laughs> you know, we need to know and trust each other. Um, I think trust is a big part of it. And, yeah. and that again is learned behavior from, um, you know, being uh, in, in situations that weren't so equitable. I'll just leave it there. So, you know, create your community so that you come mm. to, or say to the institution, there's an artist that um, we just provided uh, developmental support for who was honest. He says, I don't have a mentor. I don't know someone that can help me advance this. So I paired him with someone and the most unlikely duo, they're like this. Mm. They're so tight now. Um, and so that's also something that we can provide as well with our vast network of people that if you don't know someone that you feel can support you in advancing your work, then we can help you do that. I think that's really uh, important for artists to uh, have that support where they can feel safe to bounce off ideas and they can feel safe to fail because you need to throw some stuff on the wall and just see what sticks. Yeah. And we often don't have the luxury because of limited resources um, to test things out. And, you know, it's about research and testing and then refining. Um, so that's what I would offer to um, young artists. And don't feel as though a lack of response is a no until you hear a no. Sometimes folks mm -hmm. are just busy. And I'm like, keep, keep emailing me or ask me, are you interested or not? Because sometimes I'm just trying to understand where could this fit? So, um, you know, maintain those relationships. Um, I would say, I would say that, uh, I would say you should hold an institution and even yourself accountable as long as it's coming from a courageous space. And I use the word courageous versus brave because Shade mm -hmm. was the CEO of a VT reminding me that the center of courageous means heart and bravery is utilizing a space called muscle. So if we're if we're thinking about really, like Kevin, you talked about love uh, at the, around the top of this, how love is a powerful currency that James Baldwin talks about, and also a powerful notion of just found, uh, at the foundation of how change can actually happen. Um, love being a very strong vibration that we all actually yearn for from the moment that we for our, I think from, I believe for the duration of our existence on this planet. So if we can speak in that accountability from the space of our courage, a space from our love space, our love space to make this place um, better than when we first walked in, I think that you should always do that. I think that you should hone that tongue, hone that perspective and hone that, that, uh, that the ways of action. Um, I think that that is your, that might be your, your whole purpose for being in relationship with that institution. Um, I think that, I, I think that, um, a young artist should try to level up together, finding your peers as, as Monique was talking about colleagues. Um, uh, the more and more you're able just to bring and rise as a tide, um, you understand that you're not in isolation by yourself. Um, I think that this career can feel very isolating and there is an element of solitude that's a part of it, but there also is an element of flocking that helps to elevate and helps to move things forward. So I will say flock together, um, which has a, has a huge bit of uh, collaborative operation, like you're collaborative, you're able to figure out who goes head, who goes tail, like, like, you know what I mean? Like if you actually study flocking, you understand the people in the back actually do more work and the people person in the front and they the reason why they rotate so that you can rest slowly but surely throughout the journey to the destination um and then also i would say speak from a courageous space learning how to strengthen your courageous tongue action and way of being so that you're able to bring um the love of an institution to its actual space um uh while you're also doing that for yourself i i want to um say that I don't think it's just for young artists. I think it's for all artists um, because let's, let's think about the fact that August Wilson was basically 40 when he mounted his first show on Broadway. Toni Morrison was basically 40 when she wrote her first novel. Um, who, no matter what age you are, what generation you are, you have to study the craft. There's no getting around yeah. it. You have to know the craft. If you're, if you're gonna be a playwright, you need to know theater. You need to know plays. If you're gonna be a Essayist, you've got to read the best essayists out there. It just goes across the board. You've got to know your craft. I don't, I mean, 
I still, there's not a day that goes by I don't read. I take it very seriously as a writer. You have to read if you're a writer. You know, whatever your art form is, you have to actually know it and know the history of it. That's one. Number two, I'm just going to say it very bluntly. I think the theater world is brutally, brutally racist. I have worked in film. I've worked in TV. I've worked in theater. I've worked at magazines, newspapers. I'm working in the podcast world, I'm working on a multi-platform project around Tupac Shakur right now, including a biography of that young man. I have never been in a space as brutally racist as the theater world. Mm. I've produced with my then wife, we're now divorced, a play called She, a choreo play. It went well when it was off, off Broadway. It went well when it was off, off Broadway. I, I was able to do it because to Monique's point, I make things happen. I don't wait for things to happen. I don't do permission stuff. I'm like, I'm gonna learn this theater world. I didn't go to any theater programs, but I'm like, I'm gonna study this. I'm gonna pay attention to this. What I found, the further we went along, there were barely any people of color at any of these major spaces. And the same answer over and over again, no and no and no. And then when you get to the Broadway level, out of the 40 production companies that produced the shows on Broadway, one is run by a black by a black woman and a black man. One, one. I want us to think about that for a second. Think about all the artistic directors at all the off-Broadway places, all the off-off-Broadway places. What is the background of those folks? And who's deciding what gets to come in and what doesn't come in? And so that was our experience. And when I think about it, um, it collapsed. And Jonathan knows what I'm talking about because we had a conversation about it a couple years ago. It collapsed, you know, and I was left with a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt. And I would say that that contributed to the deterioration of my marriage because the absence of love, mostly mm -hmm. from, 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 from a lot of people, not just white folks, black folks as well. When I say love, I'm not saying give me money. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, can we have a conversation? You yeah. know what I mean? Can we have a conversation? Because if you've been in this space a little bit longer than I've been in this space, Maybe there's some conversations that we can have to help us navigate where we are now, because I know we were not the first, because I'm having a lot of conversations, you know, with Actors' Equity and say, oh yeah, we see companies failing every single day. Every, all these companies are in debt. I'm like, well, why is this going, why, did, why are people going in debt just to do theater? It makes no sense to me. You yeah. know I mean? And so, you know, to Monique's point, I think that, yeah, it's about relationships, but it's all who you know. And if you don't know these people, then you're not gonna get a show mounted. You yeah. know what I mean? And if you don't have the vision and the courage of a Barbara and Teal and start the National Black Theater, you're not even going to have a space yeah. to do that. And then, and so, and there's very few National Black Theaters. And so where do all these playwrights go? And this is a conversation that Dominique Morrison and I and a lot of Black theater folks have had, you know, where do we fit in if you actually want to create theater here, you know? And it's, it's, yeah. it's a profound challenge. Um, I can tell you, I love collaborative spaces. I have never in my life experienced the kind of failure I experienced after the show collapsed. Mm. ever as an artist in my 36 years of being an artist because of the lack of support and the brutal racism of the of the theater world you know what I mean and I think that as we're talking about Black Lives Matter this is a real conversation needs to happen which is whether the artist is 20 years old or 40 years old or 60 years old if they have something to say are you willing to support them if they don't fit into mm. the box of what you think Black theater should look like mm. you feel what I'm saying you know, and why are we only allowing certain people to get through? Like I can say in my world as a writer, I've gotten through, but I know there's writers as talented or way more talented than me who should have had 15 books by now, but certain yeah. people are allowed to get through. Do you feel what I'm saying? Absolutely. I, but because I practice the Harriet Tubman theory, which is I don't want it to just be about me as a book author. I think all of us who have something to say, if we actually are good at what we do, should be in that space. What I found in the theater world, the higher up we went, the narrower the space got. You know what I mean? Mm. And I said, this is horrific, you know? I was lucky enough to self-fund most of it, but when we got to a certain stage, I was like, wow, this is not gonna happen, you know what I mean? And it was devastating, as I said, but it also begged the question, why is it even set up like this that people end up in debt? And not just black, right, black theater people, but all theater people where you're struggling just to mount a show. Why does it cost so much? And one of the other question I was asking as we were doing one production of the show, why is it that there are no black people working behind the scenes for most of the productions? You know what I'm saying? And then I'm being told, well, here's the union set up. And, you know, if you're not union, well, how can you get into the union? So it comes back to that conversation that Spike Lee had to have in the film world. I need to have black and brown people in the union so they can actually be electricians and gaffers and all this other stuff as well. So when I say power, this conversation is irrelevant to me if it's not about yeah. the whole landscape of what this looks like, whether you have the National Black Theater or you're on Broadway. Black people should not be struggling. People of color should not be struggling to mount a play. They should not end up in debt because of a play. That's absolutely obscene to me. Absolutely. Well, oh, Monique, I, yeah. want, I just wanted to say, Kevin, um, for you not to have 
a long experience in, as a theater producer, you were, you, were, you were pounding the pavement and going in front of the First Corinthian Baptist Church, that was something that a lot of theater folks wouldn't think to do. Like the audience development person, shout out to Marcia Pendleton, yeah, would think out. to yes, do that. Yes, Marcia. Marcia. But as a producer, you know, so you were doing all of, of, of uh, making all the moves that needed to be made. Um, so I just wanted to commend you on that and offer that we should have another conversation around philanthropy and I funding. I think about Liz Diamond and Stickfly. Mm. And yes. there was a group of um, Howard alumni that created an LLC you know, because you see these Broadway producers and you see these names and one name might have five other people behind them. Yes, very true. And so understanding philanthropy, understanding how do we fund these projects and we oftentimes aren't the ones putting the money down. Okay. And so um, that's a conversation we need to be having now that's as well. needs to happen because, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of us do not support theater, unfortunately. You know what I'm saying? Some of us do, but not enough of us do. And I think it's important because we're, you know, one, one of the conversations that I had was with a very wealthy black person. They actually said, well, I'm not going to make any money out of this. Well, I mean, for Christ's sakes, I'm directing my first documentary film right now. Documentary films don't make any money, but I'm doing it because I love documentary films, just like Jonathan yeah. and do theater because you love theater. We're not in this because we want to make money. We do it because we know it's important for the lifeblood of our communities to do theater. And so I think that that's part of the conversation that needs to happen, you know, after we get this monster out of the White House, you know what I'm saying? How do we support the arts, even if it's not making you the investor money? You know, do we understand that this is about the history and traditions of our community? So I agree with you. I'm down to be part of that conversation. And there's so ah, few uh, Broadway producers that are actually earning, yeah. making money. I mean, I don't know what the what the statistics are, but Hamilton is an anomaly. It's an anomaly. Hundred okay? <laughs> percent. Yeah. Most Broadway producers are not making money. They yeah. love it, and so they're able to invest. So that we need to put that together. Right. I that agree. sounds like the next conversation. <laughs> I, 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 that would be a, I, like I am. I'm pumped for that because that that's thrivability and sustainability right there. You know what I mean? And you know when we talk about internally with when when black survivability and sustainability and longevity, right? I think that's that's the way we need to keep moving. So. I want to personally say thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan, thank you, Monique. This thank was absolutely awesome. And thank you, Transport Group. And just a reminder, you can stream Broadbent Arkansas until Sunday, and all donations go towards the Black Theater Network. And I'm so thrilled to be an institutional partner with the Transport Group, and we look forward to continuing that relationship. But first and foremost, and lastly, I just want to thank the panelists for this absolutely fantastic discussion on